And what we're going to do now is to take a look at using these statements in the context of a Java servlet. What we've just seen connecting to the database was illustrated as part of just a standalone Java application, just any old Java class. But it'll work just as well in the servlet. We've also seen how to connect to the database. We've seen how to query the database and how to insert. The method of insertion will work exactly the same way for deleting, using a delete statement, an update statement, creating tables, dropping tables, whatever you want. That's all done using execute update. Here we have NetBeans. Here is the project that you can download from Blackboard. And when you unzip it and then use NetBeans to open it, this is what you'll see. Sometimes you might find that you'll get a message to say that there are some unresolved references. Typically, what you would do is to right-click on the project name, and just above properties, you'll have resolve referencing problems. So you can click on that and, and uh, resolve the problems. In this project, there are two main areas that we're going to be interested in, web pages and the servlets in the source packages. In addition to that, because we're using the connection classes, the JDBC classes for uh, the database here, we need to take the manufacturer classes, the JDBC classes, and put them into the library for this, this project. So what you would typically do is right-click on libraries, and then, assuming it's come to you as a jar file, or indeed a zip file, the same would work, you click on add jar slash folder, and that will bring up a, an explorer window that you can use to navigate to the, the jar file or the zip file containing the package of JDBC classes that you've downloaded from the manufacturer's website. That will then list it here. So what I've already done here is use the Oracle JDBC classes and uh, pointed this project to the jar file that contains them. So you might need to do that for your examples and, and exercises. Now before we look at the servlets, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've got here. Here is a, a, an index.jsp. It could just as well in this example have been a, a, an index.html file uh, because all we've got here is just some standard HTML. And we've got the form. We're using a post method, so it's going to set up a, an HTTP post request. That's the URL of the servlet that we want to activate. And we're asking the user for the username and password. We're using a text input box and a password input box. And we're naming them uname and pword, respectively. Remember, those names will become the parameter names when the request is submitted to the uh, web server. And then we've got a submit button as well. What happens when the user clicks that submit button is, as we saw last week, the web browser will submit an HTTP POST request to the web server. The web server will pass that request on to the servlet container, and the servlet container will then determine which servlet class to activate. And the way that it does that is by looking in web.xml. So if we open web.xml, we can see there is a URL pattern here that matches the URL that we used in the form. That URL is then found and matched against the servlet name, which is an internal name within the XML file. Having determined for this mapping that there is a servlet name, we can then look for, in the servlet tags, a servlet name that matches, which it does. And then that gives us the actual servlet class that will be executed. What we're doing then is separating the way that the user refers to the servlet by its URL from the actual internal class name. And that can be useful for a couple of reasons. One of which is when the user downloads this JSP or, or HTML file, they could look at the source code for that and could work out that there, oh, there's a servlet. Look, it's called Access Database. Well, actually, that's not the name of the class. And so it prevents a bit of hacking going on when uh, users are so inclined. So that's how the servlet is identified, and the container, the servlet container, will then activate the nominated servlet. In this case, Access Database Example servlet, which we have got in the source packages, in the servlets package. There it is. So if I open this up now, we can take a look at it. 
there's a whole load of import statements. We're doing some input and output because we're writing back to the web browser. So we're importing from java.io. We're also interacting with the database. And so therefore we're importing from java.sql. We've also got some references to classes in the Java X servlet and Java X servlet.http packages. So this is a standard servlet in as much as we've got our class that extends HTTP servlet. And then if I come down here, down at the bottom here, we've got the do get method and the do post method. So it will support get requests and post requests. In both cases, they're, all they're going to do is call the process request method, which is this one here. Let's work our way through process request. The request object gives us information about what was requested, including the parameters that came from the HTML form. And the response object, which comes as a parameter, gives us information about the response so that we can set up a connection back to the web browser and write the HTML that we're generating and sending back to be displayed for the user. So here on line 42, we're calling from that request object the getParameter method, passing in here the name of the parameter, which, of course, is the name of that text box. So the spelling here and the spelling there have got to be precisely the same. We're doing the same with P word as well. So by the time line 43 is finished executing, we've got two variables containing data that was supplied by the user on the HTML form. We're going to write information back to the web browser, so we're setting up here on line 46 the print writer that goes back to the web browser. We're going to interact with the database. Therefore, we're going to use a connection object and a statement object, both of which are initialized to null at the moment. Don't worry about those warnings. I know they're warnings because, just over here, that little line is in orange. If it was an error that would prevent compilation, that would be red. But this is only a warning, and I'm going to ignore it. Here we have for our university campus-based students the URL for the student Oracle database. And you should have an account for that if you're campus-based. If you're not campus-based, then you're not going to use that at all, and you'll need to use the Glassfish database that has uh, shipped with NetBeans. Campus-based students can do that as well, and perhaps we'll look at that sometime to see how to do it. The SQL string is a variable that we'll use because we're going to uh, use it several times. The first thing we're going to do then is just to start writing back header information for the HTML that goes to the web browser. And then we can start interacting with the database. So you can see I've got all those SQL type statements, all the database interaction is inside a single try catch block that starts in line 65 and finishes on line 87. Setting up the connection, creating statements, all the updates and queries and so on, all of that is done in the one try catch block in this example. Because we're using an Oracle database, then we're going to set up the driver manager in this way. Then from that driver manager, we can get the connection using the URL. We've hard-coded because we know exactly which URL to use. And then we're going to provide what the user gave us as username and password. Therefore, we're not hard-coding the username and password into the, the program, which is probably a good thing. Then we're calling this method query depth, passing the connection and the output stream back to the web browser as the parameters. So if we scroll up now to query depth, we can see that the parameters are the connection object and the print writer. It's probably a good idea at this stage anyway to throw exception. What that means is that this method is explicitly stating if any exceptions occur, I'm not dealing with them. So it's the responsibility of the method that calls query depth to deal with them. Later on in the module, we'll consider how we can handle exceptions a bit better. Because this is performing a query, we need the result set. So we set up the result set object and the SQL string, set up the actual content of the string, select star from depth, use the connection that came as a parameter to create the statement, and then use the statement to execute the query 
that's held inside the variable there. Select star from depth. That gives us a result set. We're outputting the result set table. We're just simply echoing the result set table out to the web browser. So because it's a web browser, we're using HTML. So I'm going to set up an HTML table. So we output table to the web browser. And then for each row that we get, we're setting up a TR tag. And then for each column, a TD tag. Within that tag, we're passing the data or setting up the data to be whatever is held in the column depth no. And we're getting it as a string, whatever type of data it really is. So there we've got an example of referencing the column within the result set row by its name rather than by its index. And then after that piece of data, of course, we'll need the end TD tag. And then we do the same for the second column and then the third column. At the end of the third column, we have the end table row. And once we've iterated for as many rows as there are in the result set, we're then outputting the end table tag. That's the processing done. So we're going to close the result set, close the statement, and that's the end of executing query depth. So control then returns to line 69. That's now finished, so move on to line 71. And this time, we're going to create a statement for performing this insert and then execute the update, which will give us how many rows have been affected. And we're simply, in this example, just echoing how many rows were affected. And then to show that the insert has actually happened, we're calling query depth again that will output the same result set, except that it should now have an extra row in the table. To show you how to do a deletion, we're setting up a statement for that delete statement executing update, showing how many rows were affected, and then just to verify that the deletion really happened, call query depth again, so that we get to see the table after the deletion. When all of that is done, we've got to finally block on the try so that we can output the end body and end HTML tags. And that's how you use a relational database from within any Java program, and in this last example, how to do it specifically from within a server. All very straightforward. Perhaps the trickiest bit is working out what your SQL statement should be. And once you've got that, you just write the code in the way that we've shown you.